in Poole on England's south coast for the first of a trio of events which form the now legendary Daily Mail Harmsworth Trophy. The 100-year-old prize, which is to power racing what the America's Cup is to yachting. The cream of the offshore endurance racing world are gathered, and it's a hectic schedule to say the least. The action kicks off here at the Pool Powerboat Grand Prix with the 110 Nautical Mile Needles Trophy. With just a three-day break, they'll then face a double circumnavigation of the Isle of Wight before completing the series in epic style with the 210-mile Cowes Torquay Cowes Round Trip. This is the trophy which they'll be competing for, a prize with a long and illustrious past. We spoke to leading racer and Harmsworth Trophy chairman, the Earl of Normanson. The trophy really is steeped in history and it, it went to America uh, Garwood won it for many, held it for about eight years, and uh, it's the deed of gift says it has to remain with the Royal Motor Yacht Club here, where we're running the race from this weekend. And that in those days was a, was a, a boat, the Enchantress, and by bad luck it was hit by a zeppelin in the war and burnt, plus the trophy, plus all the archives. The only thing that was left was the actual bronze uh, um, bit of the trophy. And so Garwood from America very kindly donated some of his mahogany from his previous year's boat to rebuild the plinth and that was uh, I think just after the First World War. Uh, the first boat raced in uh, 1903. It was, it was um, uh, made by Sir Alfred Harmsworth of Associated Newspapers who are now sponsoring the, the event this year, the Daily Mail. And um, in the first race which was in Cork, 1903, it was an eight mile course, one American, one English boat and uh, the leading boat, an Englishman, and we believe there was a lady on board as well, Dorothy Levitt, uh, one at a uh, speed just under 20 miles an hour. In those days, there were steam engines. But that was the year that the first aeroplane flew, and the Dorothy Levitt also, funnily enough, went on that year to actually get the land speed record of 96 miles an hour. The names on it is, uh, are just fantastic, of the, the amount of people who won it. You know, we've had um, Skierli from Argentina, we've had Casir Stefano Casiraghi from Monaco, so it's something that everybody in the world of public racing really, really, really wants to win. So the prize is a big one, but the challenges they'll face are equally daunting. Organised by the Royal Motor Yacht Club, the Pool Grand Prix has the perfect pedigree. And certainly this year has attracted the biggest names on the UK endurance racing scene. Chief among them, indeed, the Earl of Normanton, whose boat, Premier Crew, is appearing here for the first time with some seriously major changes. Well, uh, David Allenby, who shares the boat with me, uh, we sourced the boat three years ago in uh, Dubai. She was then uh, triple outboard. We ran last year and the year before and uh, weren't quick enough. And this is the centennial of the Daily Mail International Harmsworth Trophy, uh, which I'm chairman of the board as well. Um, we felt that in, in the centennial year, we really wanted to be in with a chance to actually win the race. So we um, took the outboards off and uh, saw some uh, twin supercharged 1,000 horsepower big block Chevys in the States and shipped them over. And uh, we've been fitting them um, for the last two months. The previous engines only gave us 750 horsepower and now we've got 2,000. Uh, it's a big heavy boat. She weighs just over five tons. But she needs more power in her to get her really up on the plane and really going. Um, and to increase our speeds from probably sort of mid low to mid 70s to probably mid to top 90s now. Bit of a panic, we didn't have everything ready until yesterday. Went in the water for the first time yesterday, one o'clock in the afternoon, had a wiring problem. Uh, we didn't actually get out to run till three. We had an hour's testing, she ran very well. Touch wood, everything working. Um, so we're very hopeful for tomorrow. Optimism running high then, but this event also accounts towards the Super Powerboat Offshore Championship, for which Vetpunk.com is flying the Austrian flag with Spar founder Hannes Bohink on the throttles. It's the same boat what uh, we used uh, last year, but it's a different concept. You know, now we are using uh, standard engines, standard gears, and uh, uh, the only way to perform in that sport is the S class. So I think the big bike jets from the prototypes are gone and the future is to have a very light boat with start standard products. That boat is uh, a 46 footer but this for 46 foot it's very special light made and that gives uh, the possibility with two engines with two 
sea tech standard engine to approach the speed, let's say, 75 to 80 knots. The difference to last year is uh, simple. Last year we had not uh, the right experience of the boat. Uh, we were very late in time, so we did not enough uh, tests. And over this uh, winter season we had time and now I think uh, the boat works well and uh, we have a complete package. For me, in the UK, you have uh, the nicest race place uh, in the world for uh, powerboat racing. You know, there is a special area in Viareggio in Italy, there is a special area uh, in Monte Carlo. But uh, I like very much uh, the, isl the island of Wight also the squadron with uh, all the facilities around, uh, very nice and I like also the sea, the rough sea here. And from six races what I did, it was uh, five races very rough. The fight against the elements and uh, I prefer to do that races. Well, a crew familiar with those notoriously rough conditions are here making those final preparations on their record holding rib, Hot Lemon. We spoke to throttle man, Mike Deacon. It's, it's particularly nice to race around here because I was, I was born in this area and I started my, uh, my boating uh, in Poole Harbour uh, when I was uh, uh, knee-high to a grasshopper, I suppose, with uh, sailing boats, uh, sailing dinghies. So uh, I know where the shallow bits are and where, they, uh, where the tides run and where they run a little bit fast and uh, where you can perhaps sneak inside and gain a few knots on somebody else. So I really enjoy racing around uh, the Dorset coast. I know it well down here. This boat is a standard off-the-shelf Scorpion uh, cabin rib. It's got uh, standard 300 horsepower Yanmar diesel engines off the shelf again, uh, and everything you see around you is just uh, off the Chandler's shelf. There's nothing special about it except the fact that the uh, the hull is really, really good for uh, running fast in heavy seas uh, and uh, doing everything a rib should do. It has ultimate safety with the tubes around it, uh, but it can go pretty fast as well. And here's the dark horse, a Razor 2. Experienced racer Paul Lammer is on throttles, but driver Andy McAteer is a newcomer. Well, the Lonely Cove has been incredibly steep, actually. I've been into ribs now for about two years, originally to get in some diving, but diving never really happened, so we kind of like the idea of speed across the water as opposed to diving beneath the surface. Um, this is my third rib, this one here. Um, fantastic boat, it's capable, capability of 90 miles an hour. Um, Paul's got considerably more experience than I have. So the best way to do it is for me to actually steer the thing, uh, keeping an eye on the pin tabs and things like that. But really Paul will be taking care of the throttles. Um, it requires a lot more experience to actually read the sea and know when to put power on and when to take it off. Uh, and bow, bow tanks, you know, putting water in the front, keeping the nose down in certain sea conditions. So that's pretty much the relationship between the two of them. Well, this is an Italian boat called a Techno 40. It's considered to be the ultimate in rigid inflatable boats. Uh, it's actually um, got twin 170, uh, 750 horsepower diesel engines in the back. She had originally 875 horsepower diesels, but they uh, tended to be a little bit uh, temperamental. So we put endurance racing engines in here now, which uh, means she should be able to do round Britain or something like that for the starter boat for now. But um, we're hoping tomorrow's going to be a rough day, because this is a rigid inflatable boat, and rigid inflatable boats go for a rough night and nothing else. They are amazing. Well, as the crew spend the last few hours before the race plotting courses and tactics, it was looking as though the rib team's wish for rough water was going to come true. Sheltered by one of the world's largest natural harbours, conditions in pool were deceptively calm. But out on open water, as we were soon to find out, matters were altogether different. We join the action now as the fleet musters and we hand over for race commentary to our reporter, Alan Morton. And Sean Normanton and David Allenby there, nervously waiting for the off. No one's looking forward to this one, I can tell you. Big seas waiting them offshore as the start boat pulls them into line. And the Paul Power Grand Prix, round two of the Spoa Championship, leg one of the Daily Mail Harmsworth Trophy, is getting underway. And the fleet powering eastwards along the coast from Poole down to Bournemouth, where the crowds are gathered on the beaches on what's a perfect British summer day. Maybe for them, but not for these teams. Legs of the Harmsworth Trophy must be a minimum 100 miles, and this will feel like a 1,000 today. Once they get offshore past the Needles, they have to head almost all the way down to Portland Bill, back along the coast, then they suffer it all again, a slightly shorter lap to finish with, a total 112 nautical miles. And 
This is the site they'll be looking forward to, but it's going to be in just about two hours' time, I would think. And out front, vetpunk.com, making advantage of its power while it can in the calmer waters. And that looked like Butsy Bullet in their wake. A good start for them away in second place, the Grey Rib. And if you've got the power, now is the time to use it. Because you can bet once they get offshore, everything will be evened up. And probably the bigger, stronger ribs will start to show and catch up. Sea conditions appearing calm enough here. And there you can see the gap. The Austrian boats already opened up on the rest of the fleet. A massive advantage. That looks like Andy McAteer's a razor too. The big open rib there in second. Which means we must have already lost Drew Langdon's Butsy Bullet somewhere. He was second right after the start. But now they head out to the needles in that first mark. And hopefully if it roughens up, McAteer's Techno 40 should gradually start to reel in the big Austrian monohull. And looking back down the field, obviously exercising extreme caution right from the off. There's Premier Crew, Throttleman and co-owner David Allenby nursing those brand new engines. Sitting back in what must be fifth or sixth place. But closing down now on the man in front. That's the open water rib of Mike and Dave Deacon in Hot Lemon. All oh, flying now. And that's going to slow them up. And look at the big holes they're heading. Five minutes into this race and already the punishment starting. Betpunk.com finds the mark and turns west now. A massive stretch of open water out in front of them, but no time to relax. McAteer's a razor two, closing on the Austrians by the minute. And we look back towards the needles. Looks to be the Deacons in hot lemon, rounding the mark in third. The open rib, Ocean Dragon, driven by Martin Lay, closing behind in fourth. And these ribs will revel in these conditions if the crew bones can take it. And have we lost Premier Crew? That's the question. No, here they come, taking no chances at the moment. The fleet heads now west on the big open water stretch out to Portland Bill. And it's Hannes Bohink leading the fleet for Austria. But closing in the background, the sole British challenger to emerge in the race so far, Andy McAteer's big Techno 40, open rib, a Razor 2, twin 700 horsepower endurance racing diesels, hammering this Italian designed hull through these tough conditions out here in the English Channel. The rest of the fleet out of sight of these leading two. But no shortage of excitement back with the pack, though. We're back just in time to see Premier Crew ease the throttles open and cruise past Ocean Dragon to take fourth place. Navigator Chris Allenby there wiping down his visor. Creature comfort's a little thin in these open cockpits. But his cousin Dave Allenby opening up now the 1,000 horsepower big block Chevys. Riding the throttles constantly, backing off when the boat clears the water to avoid over-revving, then hitting the power again when it's needed. Pulling up alongside, hot lemon now. But as the going gets rougher, this could be an interesting little battle for third. Oh, Vetpunk takes a massive hit there. And these big monohulls are built to take a beating, but they've got their limits, as we found out when we took a tour of the boat before the race. Yeah, I'm Miles Jennings. I'm uh, the driver on this boat. There's a driver and a throttle man, uh, uh, in addition as a navigator. Uh, essentially, my role on the boat is to steer the course uh, to the GPS spotter that's provided by the navigator uh, and keep an eye on all the dials. Um, Hannes is a uh, throttle man and uh, he is throttling by hand both engines and also operating the trim, uh, both the drives, uh, the flaps and the tabs as well. So he's controlling the attitude of the boat as it goes through the water. It's a fantastic boat because of its length and its reach for offshore conditions such as this. And having the uh, Lexon canopy, and this is the type of material that's used in F-16 American fighter jets. Uh, it's a safety canopy. Uh, we've got sprung-loaded seats, which allow you to absorb a lot of the shock from the waves coming through. Uh, we've got a five-point harness system, so you're fully strapped in. Uh, so you just move with the boat, and the, the shock's taken out of the waves with the seats. Uh, in an emergency, there is an oxygen life support system so that um, should the boat roll over uh, and obviously being strapped in, one has breathing with the tanks for about 20 minutes as well. Uh, the helmets which we use are essentially rally-based helmets uh, with a 
an inbuilt intercom system, similar to the ones used in the World Rally Championships. Uh, so we're able to control them and talk to each other using these helmets. This particular boat um, is very much sort of a, a leviathan of the seas, uh, you know, the endurance class, uh, designed to uh, really take the sea in its stride. You know, being 47 foot long, it's got a lot of reach, so it can uh, tackle the rough weather conditions very well. Um, it has a two-speed gearbox, ZF gearbox, which allows it to, a bit like a car, you can have the lower gear ratios when it's rough, where you can really charge them through, great for acceleration, um, getting away on the starts, and also when conditions are really tough you can you can be in the right gear at the right time and then obviously put into second gear when you want the speed at the top end but there's not much top end today as vet punk's crew take a wary look back over their shoulder and that's why a razor two the big british entered open ribs sitting on their tail that's how close they are it's a real battle building now for the lead a real battle going on for third place as well. Premier Crew, last year's triple outboards replaced now with two 1,000 horsepower inboards. They may not be used to all that power just yet, but they're moving up, leaving Hot Lemon back in fourth. Now they're at the far turn mark and Hannes Bohink holding off the challenge from a razor two, but the big boat still taking a beating from these big seas. The British rib going for an outside line to find the clean water, and they take the course back now to east and the finish at Bournemouth. Hopefully, the sea should ease off as they head inland. Mike Deacon's Hot Lemon not giving up yet. They've retaken third place as they and Premier Crew 2 head back down the coastline. On board with Premier Crew. Throttle man and driver there riding the shocks. As the boat hits crest after crest. But now they're looking for calmer water near the cliffs, hoping to re-steal that third place back from the Deacons. Not much chance of catching this, however. Andy McAteer's a razor two. Hard on the tail of vetpump.com. They've lost the slight advantage they had in the rougher water. And now it's going to be down to pure speed on the water. But still there's some big holes out there, as the Austrians have been finding. But now they're on the inside and charging home. Bohink, helicopter overhead, following him into the finish. And he makes it to the pier, but only just seconds ahead. He's looking around for where McAteer is. Just three seconds in it as they come through, just pipped by the Austrian, both pushing it as hard as they dare. Maybe McAteer started his run a little too late, but there's another battle going on here for third place. Mike Deacon is holding off Premier Crew. But not for long as Sean Normanton and David Allenby push on the power. They find the calmer waters, and that's to their advantage. They've nursed these new engines all the way round, over 100 nautical miles. And now, with the pier in sight, they're opening it up. And there's not a lot Mike and Dave Deacon can do about that. The big Cougar making the last turn. running down the coast now towards the finish they've got another couple of big big races to face within the next few days so this gently gently approach here at Paul should pay off for them and they've been dreaming of that sight no doubt for the last two hours over the line premier crew take third points safely in the bag ready to take them forward to the round the island race in three days time Hot Lemon over the line in fourth. As Mike said earlier, the conditions were definitely in their favour and they'll be pleased with that result. But one survivor is happier than the rest. Well, there's the confirmation. Hannes Bohings, vetpunk.com, takes the win for Austria, winning out over some of the roughest going we've seen for quite some while.
Andy McAteer is a razor two, an amazing three seconds down in second, and the Earl of Normanton's premier crew taking a cautious approach, but getting a healthy third. And it's Bohenk and the Vetbun crew onto the podium then, flanked by the British contingent. Austrian flags the order of the day. As indeed, there's several bottles of champagne to celebrate that victory. So with the champagne moment over, we caught up with the crews for the story of their race. Awesome horsepower there, um, more than I've ever had to sort of deal with before. But today we, we, we just couldn't use it. I mean, the sea, sea state was horrible. We didn't know where it was coming from. Some really big holes. The whole crew are carrying sort of open wounds and bruises. And I think Chris may have a cracked rib. Um, I don't know what's under the overall, but I don't think it's going to be pretty. We went out there. Uh to finish so he did a very slow start and wanted to stay back and just see what everybody else was doing um, and slowly overtook everybody got up in the third and they were running very close all race with um, hot lemon and they were being a rib very very quick in the uh, in the rough out leg right the way down to Portland um, and we had a side-by-side -side race this hull is fantastic in the rough um, we, paved, uh, we, we, we paced them very carefully in the first lap to make sure we had the edge on them in the last lap. And on the last lap we gunned it, we did go for it. We got ahead of them, we were leading up until the last mark. And the GPS then flew out of the dashboard, hitting Andy smack in the face. And he decided as he couldn't actually see, the thing was pinned to him by the wind pressure. And we veered off to the right, we got overtaken by, by the other boat. And uh, actually, I believe we were two seconds behind at the finish. It was a fantastic finish, absolutely fantastic. I'm happy to, to win that race, but uh, in the end, we realized we broke something on the boat from the, from the structure. It is a crack, uh, looks like a cross. Uh, uh, in, the, in the middle of the boat, where there is the center of gravity, you know. It had also a small problem with uh, the support of the engine. So it was at least a good luck uh, to finish the race. In the moment, I can say nothing to that, clearly. Well, a real sting in the tail for the Austrians. Victory at what could be an unfortunate price. With just three days before the boats line up for the round the island race, Vetpunkt is shipped up to the Sunseeker workshops, where the team will be working to repair massive structural damage. Hannes Boeing not looking quite as relaxed and confident as the victor perhaps ought to. Welcome back as now we take a brief break from the action at the Daily Mail Harmsworth Trophy. With round one having taken its toll on competitors with some horrendously rough conditions and indeed the victorious boat Vectpunk.com undergoing repairs to serious structural damage, the remainder of the crews take time now to relax at the Earl of Normanton's Summerley estate. Among the guests of honour at this evening to celebrate the Daily Mail Harmsworth Trophy's 100 year history was the son of a previous winner, Lord Montague of Bewley. Well, the public could be forgiven to think that my father was entirely in mooching scene. In fact, that's why I founded a museum. But in fact, he did have a short career in motorboat racing. In fact, he won the Harmsworth Cup two years running, in 1905 and 1906, in a boat called Napier. And he, at one time, I think, held the world speed record for water, which is 31 knots. <laughs> but anyway, he and his uh, co-driver, son of the Rothschild, uh, had uh, quite a career in, in motorboat racing at Ockershaw and in Southampton and places like that. But it's rather interesting looking back to 1905. My father uh, did a one lap and the whole list of the head went off and they prepared it for two hours, started again and won the race. The trophy's founder, Sir Alfred Harmsworth, was also proprietor of the Daily Mail, an association the newspaper is very proud to maintain. Well, absolutely. We've um, taken it on um, because it is its centenary year. It was started by uh, Lord Northcliffe, Alfred Harmsworth at the time, so it holds the name, the Harmsworth Trophy. And he was a man of great imagination, um, great skill, and during the years between 1903 and 1909, put up trophies for air races across England um, to uh, Birmingham and back, the first air flight across the Channel, the Blair Air Flight. Very interested in motor cars, drove them all over the place, turned over in them on his way to his house in, in, in Fannet, but promoted them. And indeed, it would be totally out of character for him not to do something connected with the sea. And I think this is a wonderful trophy. Uh, it's in its centenary year. It's a very beautiful trophy. 
he would have been very proud to think that the thing is still running now and be astonished at the boats behind. And mind you, he'll be on one of them if he had the chance, but I think he was still alive. Um, but that's a, that's a wonderful thing that he's done. And of course, like um, the other interests that he had, it went on to develop. And I believe the speedboat went on to develop into the motor torpedo boat, which played such an important part in the Second World War. So an event steeped in history, but nevertheless, one which has moved on with the times. Just three days later, indeed, the move was made down to that boating mecca of cows on the Isle of Wight. The start and finish point for round two. Another test of endurance for both the boats and their crews, the 121-mile double circumnavigation round the island race. Having spent the past few days watching his boat, vetfunk.com, undergoing repairs to structural damage sustained in round one, we caught up with trophy leader, Hannes Bohink. Uh, after the first hit, we had a big problem, but uh, the problem was at least not so big. We have no structure problem anymore, so we fixed it. And uh, also the problem with the engine support was not so big. It was, it was only broken, the, the support uh, on the engine. And we had a spare engine, of course, and we changed it. So after three days of uh, no sleep and uh, a lot of work, uh, we finished the boat. And we tested yesterday and it is running very well. So today it's not so rough uh, than on Sunday last week, so uh, in that case we will have a quicker race, we will perform a little bit more on speed and that's it. Tell us what's going to be your tactics considering you've had to, are you going to have to be cautious with your repair or are you just going to go full throttle? No, the tactic is we stay as long as possible with the others and uh, we want to watch what's, po what's possible for us in the race and then we we try to, to go. Well, vetpunk.com's British driver is equally relieved to have made the start line here in Cowes. Well, it's been an absolute hive of activity. I'm almost surprised we're here. Uh, fantastic race last Sunday. We won by three seconds. Uh, unfortunately, we sustained major damage to the port-hand side of the craft. A very large eight-foot crack that almost went right the way down to the hull. So we've been really burning the midnight oil, not only getting the materials, which are quite difficult to find some of the composite Kevlar's but then repairing the boat, getting it dried and set in time so that we can go out today and have another hard race. Uh, the repair seems to be absolutely fine so we're going to put that to the back of our minds, you know, we're not even going to think about it, we're just going to race as hard as we need be. Obviously conditions are a bit, you know, rough, we might just just hold back a bit, you know, it's an endurance race, three heats, uh, we're not, you know, we need to win each race or at least finish each race to be in with a chance so uh, we'll play can, you know, our race according to the conditions. The crew that had run them so close have had their three days filled with frantic engine rebuilding and testing. They too have made it just in time for scrutinizing. Well, we thought we had a, a problem with one of the engines, so we've had to completely uh, check absolutely everything on the, on the craft, but uh, we seem to be in good shape. We, the noise that we had at the end of the last race, which was a loud knocking sound, um, appears to have disappeared. Tell us, are the conditions favourable for you today? They're getting that way. Uh, at the moment, no, they're, it's too calm for us. We're not the fastest boat. We're probably something like fourth fastest boat in ultimate top speed. Um, but if the conditions are going to be a bit choppy around the other side, we stand a good chance of pulling up on the others. So we're hoping for a bit of rough stuff. Well, there were only minor engine problems that worried the Premier crew team. So they're confident, but they're pretty clear about their tactics for today's race. Finish get back and finish no, 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 try not to break anything we got you know another big race on Saturday it's a marathon it's the Daily Mail endurance you know British and International Harmsworth so um, the boat touch wood is running fine and uh, we're just gonna go out there and uh, be sensible you know it's, it's 110 miles twice around the Isle of Wight today but then on Saturday we got the big one so with the top three contenders crossing some fingers and indeed toes as to whether they can last the distance it's time for them to line up once again to do battle. And this is no day tour around the island. Rounds of the Spur Championship all have to be a minimum of 100 nautical miles. So it's a quick loop for the crowds in the protection of the Cows Bay, and then off into whatever the English Channel might have in wait for them off the southern coast. But no time to worry about that now. The yellow flag goes to green, and leg two of the DM Harmsworth Trophy, leg three of the Spur Championship, is underway with all the hard charges hitting the front. Trying to get momentum just right at the start signal. Timing the run to be almost at maximum as the green flag drops can give you that crucial head start. And as 
two that have done that to great effect. Vet Funk on the shore side and Premier Crew near side. On board with Premier Crew, Sean Normanton centre. Concentration fixed ahead to his right, throttle man Dave Allenby. Keeping an eye out for where everyone is. But ahead of them now, Hannes Bohenka, Mars Jennings. No holding back to stay with the fleet as predicted. They clearly want to dictate from the front while they've got the power advantage in the flatter waters. Getting away, but chasing down behind them now. Andy McAteer, Paul Lemmer and the crew in a razor two. They won't want to let them get too far away, keeping them in their sights. As they get down to the bottom mark, ready for the loop around the bay. Let pop through and charging. But Premier Crew going well too. Banking round the turn. Closing all the time and making up ground after their slow start. Dave Allenby looks around and taking the tighter corner and shadowing them all the way. It's McAteer. Looks to be taking it easy at the moment. Maybe that's the tactics. They all want to keep Vetpunkt in sight. But now's not the time for heroics. And from Vetpunkt's point of view, it's time to get the throttle down while they can. Hannes Bohink is the man on throttle. He turns the top mark in the bay here. Turns it tight, looks out the window to see where the competition is. And then his eyes set forward. Down the start finish straight again and heading for open water. And who knows what awaits them down at the needles. Still going up the other side of this internal loop. Mike Deacon, he's back in fifth. Seaham five, they're up into sixth. And that means ahead of them, in fourth place, turning the top mark, Butsy Buzzard, Drew Langdon and Jan Falkowski getting a great start. And right on the heels, it is Hot Lemon. Mike and Dave Deacon. And Chris Strickland and Debbie Pemberton. They're around the top mark too, in six and looking good. We join them now as Hannes Bohink, Miles Jennings and the crew head for open water. The engineer there, hanging on tight. And on his right, Ed Williams Hawks, the navigator. And they look back, but it's up front they need to be looking. Rougher water's coming as they head out of the Solent into the... Oh, and they've lost... No, nearly lost it. And Jennings and Bohink get a shock. Let's look at that one again. Up on one wave, trip the rear end, and nearly down in under. That was a rough ride, and that was a bit of a shock. And this is how it looked from Bohink's point of view. He's up. He's nearly down. But fortunately for them, they're not out. And on they power going to get rough from here on in. They make the mark at the needles first. They turn left well in front, but they're going to start to lose the advantage of all that power as they hit the big swells. Bohink in there. Left hand firmly on the grab handle. The right hand may be easing off a little bit on the throttles. And behind them, still, the chase for second place. Premier Crew get there first. Andy McAteer in a razor two. Still shadowing them behind. And he'll be looking at glee with these conditions. They wanted it rough, and they've got it out here. So, Normanton and Allenby. Allenby looking back. They can expect the pressure on now as they head into the rough stuff. rough it was, which meant that these boys, Andy McAteer, Paul Lemmer and the crew, in a razor two, could put on the pressure, because the rough stuff suits them no end. And the 
black Butsy designed rib pushing on and pushing on the pressure as Premier Cruz soak up the big holes and flying again despite this boat being nearly five tons it's the heavier boat that'll give McAteer on the far side an advantage but they might just start to take it a little bit easy on those thousand horsepower twin Mercury cruisers all in the boat just over a week ago and indeed they are McAteer getting the advantage and getting ahead into second place and now determined to track down Betpong and fourth place also loving the conditions Drew Langdon and Jan Falkowski in the Butsy Bullet but Mike and Dave Deacon have still got them in their sights and they'll revel in these conditions too they're used to being on offshore adventures been round Britain in this one, held the record as well. Two Yamaha diesels thumping out 640 horsepower. They're looking comfortable. No doubt we'll wait for the others to break. But this is the man they've got in their sights at the moment. Drew Langdon, Jan Falkowski. And they're passing someone in the background. Someone stopped. And it's Premier Crew stopped dead in the water. Dave Allenby on there on the right with his helmet off. Sean Normanton in the middle. Now, how temporary is it? Having a look underneath, having a look round. But the helmets are off. And the back is up, and that looks pretty terminal. Is this the end of their Harmsworth Trophy dreams? crew not stopping to ask them see how five Chris Strickland and Debbie Pemberton they'll take the advantage of moving up to fifth place overall Bo Hink comes around to complete lap one another hour's driving probably in front of him while he does that we take a chance to learn a little bit more about the new association that hopes to bring a new drive to offshore endurance racing now known as SPOA SPOA stands for the Super Power Boat Offshore Association and was uh, created by uh, Hannes Bones of Austria and uh, Tommaso de Simone uh, of Italy. Um, this is the, the first year that we've put the championship together um, and uh, it consists of five races. Um, one in Naples, uh, three here at, uh, in Cowes at the Harmsworth Trophy and uh, the, uh, the fifth one in, uh, in uh, Via Reggio in Italy. Both uh, Tommaso and, and Hannes felt that they wanted to uh, promote endurance racing, international endurance racing as a whole, and, and that's really the concept behind SPOA. We've been really pleased with uh, the turnout, uh, especially here at Cowes, um, and uh, we have quite big plans for next year. Um, we're planning on a minimum of uh, five races held again in at least three international locations. Locations as yet uh, are not completely decided. That really depends on uh, further conversations with the UIM and uh, the trustees of the Harmsworth Committee. So we're hoping that we can get, get together and, and finalize those details so that we can, uh, can continue to have uh, a lot of boats ready to race next year. We're looking to involve Eastern European countries, certainly concentrate uh, with, the, with the Italians, always very keen to, to be involved. Uh, and obviously to have some more British races involved. And we go back to the race, picking it up here, halfway round, lap two. And still, Hannes Bohink, Miles Jennings and the crew pushing on in vetpunk.com and looking comfortable despite all the nervousness about those repairs. Slowing up a little, but behind them, they were boats chasing them, and the gap was closing. Back in fifth place, Seahound still going strong. The boat built for these conditions, and they're reveling in it. But up front, you wouldn't call it reveling. High and flying, Andy McAteer in third place at the moment. And looking calm on board. They've been slowing slightly and catching them all the time has been Mike Deacon waiting to pounce. His chance to get into third place. And Mike and Dave Deacon, their Scorpion design hull, 
have been holding back all the race. Now's the time to push, and they do. And that looks like a very slow eraser too. So Hot Lemon up into third, but this is the man they've got to catch to get into second. Drew Langdon and Jan Falkowski running well. But the man still running well. Well, maybe not so well. Engineer and Selmo Maori going down below decks and they're slowing. Maybe this race isn't all over. And not looking at the engine covers, going inside the hole. Maybe that crack has started to reappear. Well, Langdon and Falkowski won't know that. But if they get them in sight, you can bet they'll double their pace. But they're pushing hard all the way now. Pushing their twin Mercuries to the limit. Well, they don't sight Vetplunk yet, but they do sight the old forts that signal the entrance to the eastern Solent. And that will mean calmer waters, and they're nearly home. But charging home, problems or not, the Vetplunk.com crew, Hannes Bohink and Miles Jennings, crossed the line in first place. 48 hours ago, they weren't even sure if they'd start. Closing the gap all the time. A fantastic second place for Drew Landon and Jan Falkowski after the disappointment in Paul. And chasing home side by side. Andy McAteer never giving up to the death, but it's Hot Lemon who are going to come in third. And Andy McAteer will have to be content with having scored points and surviving to continue his challenge in leg three. So there you have it. The official results confirming another victory. The second for Hannes Bohings, vetpunk.com. Bootsy Bullet, nine minutes behind, and the ever-present Hot Lemon hanging on there for third. Andy McAteer is a razor two, surviving for fourth. Celebrating their survival in a patched-up boat, a relieved Boehink and driver Miles Jennings. It was quite rough. I was thinking it's not so rough, but it was nice. So you had 50% inside of the channel. You had a acceptable nice speed and outside it was quite rough in the south especially it was pretty rough but it was a good race and uh, I think we have maybe 10 minutes or 15 minutes in front of the second boat so we prepared the boat well and we are happy with it it was worth working night and day for it yes yeah, it was a hard job it was it was too tough uh, sometimes but uh, it was 16 hours of work to prepare it again but at least now we are fine we really had a really very enjoyable race. It was a very tactical race. Obviously, it's 121 nautical miles. There's a long way to go. Um, we had a real mixture of sea conditions uh, on the way down to St. Catherine's Point. Uh, it got steadily rougher once we got past bridge. Around by the needle set, it really was quite lumpy and rough. And the boat was pointing to the stars, so we really just had to control things and drive in a very sort of uh, easy fashion, knowing that we've got two laps of the island work to do. You know, we've got a lead which we wanted to hold on to. Once we got around St. Catherine's Point, the, it calmed off and we were able to throttle forwards and then it roughed up a little bit coming around here, but really down by St. Catherine's Point, you know, needles that was quite rough, quite rough. And another happy man in second, Drew Langdon. We had a great race, great race. We, um, we got a very good start. Uh, we were on the, on the landward side. The bigger boats got ahead of us. And as it got choppier, they managed to pull away, but we held our own on the other side of the island. Uh, made it up again uh, when it was flat in the lee and kept going and yeah we got quicker and quicker throughout the day and had a fantastic ride very delighted mike congratulations you must be pleased with the results yes we certainly are we never realized that we'd be third until we crossed the line and somebody came over and told us we thought we were fourth tell us a little bit about the race what are the conditions like oh pretty bouncy uh, it doesn't seem like it when you stand here just looking out there but you get down by the needles and especially running over from the needles to st catherine's that was pretty rough stuff yeah, but it was, uh, it was good. We were able to uh, trim the boat right down and uh, push through it. We were doing 45, 50 knots through there most of the time, but flying a great deal and coming down pretty hard. When I started the race, I was six foot six tall. Look at me now. <laughs> and overcoming engine problems in fourth, Andy McAteer. We put it down to fuel starvation. Uh, then we spent pretty much the rest of the time just limping around. The, star, the port engine was running fine. We ran that full blast the whole way with the starboard engine cutting in and out, in and out. Just hoping we could make a third, but we just squeezed them full, so we were happy with that. And limping home eventually, a very disappointed Premier crew. Well, we were running fine, we were running second. Um, 
we just let Hannes go because he was so much quicker and we were holding big rib and um, we're just going to stay there and we we're running perfect the boat was running perfect everything went around the needles a bit lumpy there um, but nothing you know nothing compared to last Sunday we we're running fine and suddenly the oil pressure dropped off on the uh, starboard engine and um, the smoke came out so we shut down and um, we don't know what's gone wrong we might have thrown a piston or so anyway the engine's gone will it be sorted for the next race don't know took a chance to speak to the man who's under pressure about why he enjoys the sport so much. It was very simple. In uh, the beginning, with 18 years, I was involved in motor bicycle races and I was always very interested in motorboat sport. So after a time lack of 12 years where I have to uh, form my company, to establish the company, I was looking for another motorsport and uh, in the end, I did the decision to run the powerboat races. The statement always here in Chaos was the man against the elements. And I think the nicest uh, activity in the sport is to fight outside from the coast in offshore. And uh, for me, also class one or class two is uh, a very famous uh, uh, racing series but uh, in the end it's really expensive and on the other hand I like much more the V bottom boats and uh, so I prefer uh, the endurance races. The tactic for tomorrow is very simple now we have 800 uh, points in the back and uh, we start tomorrow we take it easy we spare everything we maintain the speed from the beginning and uh, we have to, to be back in port. That's the most important thing for tomorrow. So we take it easy. But it's the end of the road for the Earl of Normanton, chairman of the Harmsworth Trophy trustees. But his colours will travel to Torquay as his young son, inspired by his first glimpse of the sport, has signed up for the race and is about to get a brief taste of what it's all about. Well, I've very kindly been offered the opportunity by Peter and Ian um, to go with them tomorrow in the race. Um, today we're just taking this boat out to get a feel for the thing, see how it goes. Is he your father's replacement? Um, yes, anyway, he's uh, very unfortunately, uh, his engines blew yesterday, so uh, luckily I'm kind of continuing their name, keeping us going in the race, so hopefully this is going to give me the taste of bread, and I might catch his log. How are you um, feeling at the moment? Pretty good, excited, very excited. Enjoy it. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you very much. With the family tradition being carried on, time for his father to tell us more about the prize they've been racing for over these three races. Well, it was cast, as you know, by Sir Alfred Harmsworth um, in 1903, and um, Garrard's made the trophy. In the early days, it was it's always been for the nation to win. Um, so the first race was in Cork, in Ireland, um, and the winner was um, an English boat, and uh, we believe there was the famous Dorothy Levitt, lady on board. Um, and then, in those days, they were running, I think the winning speed was just under 20 miles an hour, and it was an eight-mile eight course, so quite short. But they were, some of them was, in the early days, steam engines, um, and very wet. Um, and uh, then the Americans came in a bit later on, um, and that made it truly international. And um, is what it is today but uh, it's very it is the america's cup of powerboat racing it is the most prestigious trophy in the world and uh, everybody's wanting to win it it's been in many many areas of boating but we've now found a, a true home because the true essence of the uh, trophy is to uh, improve the hull and machinery um, and it's really it's man and machinery against the elements and with the endurance racing that we are putting on this weekend um, and last weekend in Poole, um, it is certainly a true test of that. Tomorrow, the final round of the Daily Mail International Homesworth Trophy will be the Cows Torquay Cows, and that is the, the 43rd running of the race, and that is the most famous race in the world um, by far, and everybody wants to come and win it. They want to win the Homesworth, obviously, but there was, they've always said that if you haven't won the Cows Torquay Cows, um, which is 210 nautical miles. It's a very, very long race, very tough. 
if you haven't won that, you're not a, a true world champion. And it's that reputation that brings them from far and wide to contest this famous race every year. Time for the Red Funnel Fast Jet to take a break from its normal duties, ferrying from the mainland to the island, and get ready to act as start boat to this race. Let's take a look at what's in front of them. The starting cows down the Solent and then hugging the coast past Portlandville and on down to Torquay where they take an hour's break to refuel, restarting and then all the way back. 210 nautical miles in all. It's going to be a long, long day. And plenty lined up, willing to have a go at it. Waiting for the start. The green flag's there. The full power's on. And boats of all shapes and sizes take on the challenge. Vetpunk.com, Hannes Bohenk squeezing down the inside, right on the edge of the course. The long distance ribs on his inside, squeezing him over. They've got the drop on him at the start. But the big monohull coming up to full power. Charging to the front. Some of these long distance ribs. We're going to give the big boys a run for their money today. And they'll do a quick lap around the inner Solent here before they set off for Torquay and Nimakatia moving quietly up through the ranks as are Ian Sanderson and Peter Dredge in the Sunseeker excess racing boat they're experienced long distance men and they'll be taking it easy at this stage and vetpunk.com as expected has moved to the front now the ribs in hot pursuit Jennings carving wide. It's early days, less transmission strain. By going the long way round, they've got plenty of power, but they'll be wanting to keep out in the wide open, away from the clutter of the rest of the pack. But Jackie Hunt, Mike Shelton in the Wilson boat and Admiral's key boat, R5, getting away in a good second place. Chasing behind them, R69. The Apricot Print Racing Team of Max Walker and Mick Spong. But it's the big rib we've got to look out for. McAteer and his crew taking it easy at the moment. Coming around the outside of the Access Racing Boat. Now moving up to share fourth place with them. But as we pick them up down the Solent, it's a clear leader. Vetpump.com, nice and calm the water. And hounding them down though. Max Walker, Mick Spong. They've certainly got the power to do it in these long distance ribs. Moving ahead now of the Wilston Boat and Admiral's Key Boat. Jackie Hunt, Mick Shelton in line. A long way to go. R21 in there. Stuart Anthony, Charlie Williams Hawks, the Bridge Motorcycles team. But these are the two long distances. And a lot of confidence in the boat. McAteer running up alongside and just starting to put the pressure on to move away from the excess racing team. But the man wanting to put a great distance between himself and the rest of the pack, Hannes Bohink, putting on the pressure. Oh dear. Paul Williams, Mark Santum, Windex, already victims to the technical gremlins. David Mark Cockman, insider days. They're in the top ten, ready to put some pressure on. These boys racing for their own rib trophy as well. R10, Paul Mitson, Samuel Mitson in the Marmite boat. And R18, that's Chris Strickland and Debbie Pemberton in Seahound 5. They're, of course, challengers for the overall Daily Mail International Arms with Trophy. Just ahead, Alan and Michael back. R19, Excalibur. And just ahead of them, R3, Maverick. And R2, Hot Lemon. And we're halfway from Cows to Torquay with the big Austrian boat of Hannes Bohink firmly in the lead, starting to pull away from the pack. But plenty of nautical miles to go under the hull yet. And they'll be worrying about the crack. There it is, you can see it repaired down the side of the boat. And it looked pretty serious in the workshops. 
and everyone was surprised. It survived round the island. They're taking it easy. They've allowed R69, Max Walker and Mix Bond to come to the front. So their moment of glory, Max and Mick trying to pick up points in the Formula One rib title. Rib racing itself, expanding in popularity every year. And their mind also on picking up the prestigious title of winning the Cows Torquay Cows Classic. But the big endurance boat moving to the front now. Third of the race almost over. And they'll be starting to organise their tactics for the last run into Torquay. Sunseeker Access Racing running along nicely. James Normanton in the middle at the back. Hopefully he's enjoying it, but certainly he'll be getting a taste of reality now. And keeping their eyes on them. The crew of Andy McAteer. Eyes on the dials. Eyes out front to see if they can track down the Austrians, gradually moving up the power. And they're closing in on the Austrians as they pass Portland Bill Lighthouse. Betfunk.com, Hannes Bohink on the throttles. His English driver, Miles Jennings. His English navigator, Ed Williams Hawks. An Italian engineer on board, and Jelma Maori. They'll be looking forward to seeing that lighthouse on the way back, that's for sure. And they all now set off across the vast expanse that is Lime Bay. R11 there, the Formula 2 rib of Andy and Mel Wilby. Bouncing long in the wake of this man. Mike Deacon, third overall at the moment, remember, in the challenge for the Harmsworth Trophy. It's all too smooth out here for him, though. Suiting the faster ribs, here's one of R22, Gareth Williams and Jim Fry. But up front, the big boys are starting to turn on the power. Excess racing flying as they try to keep these people in sight. Andy McAteer, Paul Lemmer, moving slowly up through, catching and overtaking some of the ribs that made it such a great start. R5, Jackie Hunt, Mike Shelton. Apple's key boat, and now a little clutch of them all at the front of the field. This is the man they've got in sight, and it's Bohink taking it easy. And McAteer coming up to challenge him. He's been timing his run to be alongside the Austrian as they come to the latter stages of Lime Bay. And a cheeky look across and a cheeky grin. Very confident stuff from the UK boys. It's a question of who's going to get to Torquay first. And it's the Austrians who crossed the line just ahead of McAteer. Now they'll have an hour's stop for refueling, a mandatory 60 minutes before they're allowed to start the rerun back. We're beginning to listen to any noises, we, you know, <laughs> any noise we can, we'd, we'd, we'd be paranoid about, but I have to say, touch wood so far, doesn't seem to be any problems in that respect. You now the boat held together really well, the engine's on song, Fuel levels, oil pressure, water pressure, fantastic. We just ran a very easy tactical first leg of the race. So far, so good, just as we wanted it to be. Um, conditions were very, very flat, a little bit of overlying swell, but nothing was causing any problems. And we, we ran just to literally run the pace we wanted to do, which was just sort of about 70 knots, just to keep ahead of the field. We let some of the smaller ones get ahead at one point, their moment of glory as well, perhaps, but uh, we weren't really too interested in that. Obviously, with the Harmsworth, it's all about finishing. If we finish today, you know, we should be in first position, so uh, we're just going to keep going. And it's a very relaxed owner who unusually has been taking easy on those throttles. It's really calm. It's no problem for top speed racing. Sometimes you have some wash and long waves, so uh, it's better to reduce the throttles a little bit to spare all the <laughs> engine support, the engine and all this thing but it's a pretty nice day to race. We have to maintain, and uh, we have to stay with the others together, don't force too much, uh, you know. We have 800 points in the back, so. Take it easy, we take it easy. But they might just take it too easy. A Razor 2 are certainly very confident. It was just, oh, it's fun, it's, it's good. It just wants to pull off alongside, have a little wave, see how he's getting on, no pressure, mate, you know. Just fun, really. So is that the tactics for the, for the way? I mean, how's the boat holding up on the, on the way down here? Touch wood. I mean, it's, oh, I hate saying this, but I mean, it's all right. It's okay. 
keeping a good eye on the oil pressure, it seems all right. It sounds fine. We'll see what happens. Right. Okay, same tactics for the way back. A bit more pressure, I think. Yeah. A little bit more pressure. You never know. You might have tuned those engines up just a bit too much. We're hoping for a big bang. And we'll see what happens. So the scene set for some great tactics on the way back. But it was all about to change at the end of the fuel stop. It was vital that McAteer got out behind Hannes Bohink. There were only seconds between them when they came in. And that meant the rib could start only seconds behind the big Austrian monohull. But they weren't. There was no one in sight and delays in the refueling. It meant that McAteer was going to start later. No penalty to his actual race time but it meant it was going to be difficult to put on those pressure tactics and keep up alongside the Austrian. Bohink long gone across Lime Bay. And all now, McAteer and his crew, Paul Lemmer, the engineer, could hope to do, was close in on the Austrian and at least get close enough to worry them. But no worries at the moment in the cockpit. All eyes on that crack down the side of the boat. Fortunately, it's not rough today. Everyone was surprised it even survived a second race, but it has. And now it's Boeing, fully in control. And in the next few places, second to fourth in the race on the day. It was a battle between the ribs. 21 just up into second place Max Walker R69 though chasing on behind them a real battle for the Formula One ribs title but back in fifth place a rib we haven't seen the man who came second around the island Drew Langdon Yang Falkowski they're in there but they're going slower they would have been hoping to put on more of a show in this race nice flat waters as the excess racing boys come up and pass them to take over fifth place. Well, some sort of engine problems there for Landon and Falkowski. That'll be a disappointment. They'll be hoping to get home and get on that leaderboard, hoping one of the big boys breaks down. And up ahead, though, in fourth place, Andy McAteer. Fourth on the day, but more interested in his standing in the Daily Mail Harmsworth Trophy. That's the big one. Tactics being discussed but it's going to be an all-clear run for the Vetpunk.com team as Hannes Bohink rings around. Cows in sight. It's one more turn, and then it'll be down the start-finish line that they left this morning over three hours ago. And after three hard races in seven days, it's going to be victory and the spoils to Hannes Bohink and his international crew. So, as far as the running for the Vetpunk.com Super Babots Championship, these are the five teams that survived the long, long race and a long, long week. It was more than a long week. It was a week, incredible tough, but uh, this day was uh, perfect. It was a great day. The weather was nice. Everything was perfect. The boat was running fantastic. And uh, I think we did a good job for the whole week. And uh, also, we had two tough races in rough condition, and now this day with uh, this nice weather was was unbelievable, Kate. <laughs> Good morning. Paul, congratulations, second place in the Hansworth Trophy. You must be absolutely delighted. Thrilled, absolutely thrilled. Um, we've been planning to sort of do the cows talky cows for years and it's been uh, I did it once before with another friend and unfortunately then it was too rough and we had to do a shortened course so this is my first trip to Torquay and back and absolutely loved it a bit too calm for us if we'd have rough weather we would have stood a chance of uh, beating him as we proved uh, a few days ago but today was his day and he deserves the victory especially after all the work he's done we're just uh, happy to be second and indeed time to celebrate and enjoy the achievement Hannes Bohink can relax at last. And although the SPOA Championship goes on to one more leg, this is the trophy that Hannes Bohink will cover this year. These are the standings in the Daily Mail International Harmsworth Trophy, the toughest one there is to win in the offshore powerboating world. So it's congratulations to him and his team's never-say-die commitment that brought them the final honours.